Hi, I'm David Standard. I'm uh, director of the uh, Alabama Udall Center in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, really pleased I'm able to join you this afternoon to talk about some uh, hot topics in Parkinson research. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Uh, scheduling did, didn't allow that this year, but uh, maybe another time. And uh, I do hope you get a sense from this of some of the things I think are really exciting uh, in Parkinson's disease research. We'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here in the Alabama Udall Center, but I'm gonna paint a bigger picture uh, of some of the exciting work going on around the world, um, making progress towards finding better treatments and ultimately a cure for Parkinson's disease. Uh, just a few disclosures, I do consult for a variety of companies. Um, I don't think any of them are particularly relevant to what we're gonna say today, but I wanted you to be aware of these. Um, and I think it's always best to start at the beginning. Um, you know, Parkinson's disease has probably been around always, but in terms of recognition in the uh, Western medical literature, really begins with this book over here on the left side. Uh, it's a small book called An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. This is written by Dr. James Parkinson in 1817. And he uh, observed Parkinson's disease in several patients who came to see him in the office. Uh, he also sat on a park bench in London and observed uh, additional people passing by. And that's really the basis of, of his research and description of Parkinson's. And it's still a good description. Uh, he called it involuntary tremulous motion, lessened mus muscular power, parts not in action, and even when supported with a propensity to bend the trunk forward and to pass from a walking to a running pace. Uh, he didn't get it all right. Uh, he, he, he got most of it right, but uh, he felt that the senses and intellect were uninjured. And we now know that Parkinson's can have effects on both sensation and on uh, cognitive function. So uh, we've learned more since 1817, but his definition still stands the test of time. And over here on the right are some of the, the public faces of Parkinson's disease who have uh, stepped up and represented this condition really to the community. Uh, people like Pope John Paul, this is Davis Finney here, um, uh, Linda Ronstadt, Michael J. Fox, and many others that you'll probably recognize here who are really uh, have come out and spoken out and uh, I think have helped lead us forward by being inspirational and and uh, gathering uh, excitement and interest and resources around the pursuit of better treatments for Parkinson's disease. Um, in terms of the classical features, just so everyone's starting at the right place here, um, when we talk about Parkinson's disease and when we teach medical students about it, we tell them really the entry point here is thinking about the four basic clinical features of Parkinson's. Uh, this is resting tremor, a very particular kind of tremor uh, when the hand is typically at rest, uh, not doing anything, goes away when you go to use that hand, or uh, dress tremor can also appear in the face or the foot. Bradykinesia or slowness of movement, rigidity, which is resistance to passive movement you can feel in a limb, and then postural imbalance, a tendency towards fall, which is falling, which is a, a later feature in Parkinson's. But these are really the, the core features that we teach our medical students to look for when they're thinking about Parkinson's disease. And in terms of changes in the brain, the figures over on the right show some of this. At the top, uh, this is an illustration of the human midbrain. So it's a the brain stem from a human uh, autopsy. And on the left, you can see there's a black area here. This is the so-called substantia nigra or black substance. Uh, this is an area where dopamine cells are found and they're black because this neuromelanin or black substance is made as a byproduct of the metabolism of dopamine. On the right is a similar midbrain, but from somebody who died of Parkinson's. And as you can see, this is gone. 95 to 99% of these cells are depleted in Parkinson's. This is one of the, the characteristic features of it. In the middle here in the pink, uh, there's a neuron and there's a round ball found inside of it. This round sphere here, which has a pink center and a clear halo, this is a Lewy body. Uh, it's a protein, proteinaceous mass found inside neurons in the brain in Parkinson's and it's one of the hallmarks or signatures of Parkinson's. And lastly, we can actually now test for the loss of dopamine function in patients with Parkinson's during life. Uh, the bottom four panels here are a patient I had who had a, a scan very similar to what we use now is uh, called a DAT scan. This was an earlier generation and a little a different tracer, but very similar in function. 
And you can see over time, there's a loss of dopamine function in the brain. So these are classical or typical features of Parkinson's. Um, and I think uh, one of the big innovations in the field is we've gone beyond this. We've gone beyond thinking of Parkinson's as just a tremor, just stiffness, slowness. Uh, there's a lot more involved and it, it spans a much longer time course. So I would say these days you can think of at least four distinct states of Parkinson's disease. One is the very earliest state where someone has a risk for Parkinson's. Uh, maybe they have a very strong family history of Parkinson's, or maybe they're at risk for reasons we haven't entirely figured out yet, but these are people who will get Parkinson's in the future, but they may not be aware of it yet. Uh, it could be genetic, could be environmental risk, uh, but really there's no symptoms and there's, there's nothing to detect at that phase. Then there is a, a state of uh, prodromal or pre-Parkinson's state. Um, there are some features that go along with this, loss of the sense of smell turns out to be a, uh, a feature that uh, appears often years before the other symptoms of Parkinson's. Another one is REM behavior disorder or dream enactment behavior, acting out your dreams. People get very active at night, thrashing with the pillows, uh, talking in their sleep, often yelling in their sleep. Uh, turns out that this is very often a precursor of Parkinson's and probably reflects early changes in the brain um, before the ones that lead to things like tremor and the more typical features. Another very early feature of Parkinson's is constipation. Uh, and this can come on years before the Parkinson's does, but turns out that people with constipation, this is a very strong predictor of future Parkinson's disease. And so uh, now that we've started to appreciate some of these things, we're looking for them. And the more we look, the more we find, the more we understand that there actually is a state of things going on in the body with the sense of smell, dream behavior, and constipation that are really uh, on the road to Parkinson's disease. And then in early Parkinson's, you have the features I just talked about, tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and fatigue. And then later, uh, you can develop further problems, impaired balance, wearing off the variable response to medication, dyskinesia, which goes with that, some memory problems, and even hallucinations. So. Uh, this is a much broader landscape of Parkinson's than we would have talked about, say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we would have really focused primarily on the, the early PD part of this, the tremor, the bradykinesia, rigidity, and fatigue. But now we really understand it's a whole body condition, and it spans a much greater length of time. Uh, in many patients, what we're looking at on the screen is 30 or 40 or even 50 years from uh, the at-risk state all the way to uh, later Parkinson's disease. So it's a very long uh, span of time that's involved in this condition. So that's some new thinking in Parkinson's. Uh, what are the big questions in Parkinson's disease? Well, I think some of these are obvious. What causes it? Uh, we would all like to know what causes Parkinson's disease. Uh, I'd like to know that in a general sense of why do so many people have Parkinson's? And then each patient that I see, one of the first things they ask me when we diagnose Parkinson's is, well, why me? Why do I have this and why not someone else? And uh, that's a very important question. And I think we're making progress. We still don't have all the answers in this realm, but we're on our way. Um, of course, how can we treat the symptoms? Very important. We actually have some good treatments today and we'd like to have better ones tomorrow. Um, what about slowing or preventing disease progression? This is really the place Parkinson's research hopes to go. Uh, it's a very slow condition. And if we could stop the progression, um, many people would actually be fairly satisfied that. I talk with a lot of patients who see me who have uh, early Parkinson's, they have a tremor, they have uh, some other uh, early mild symptom. And it's not that symptom that really bothers them that much. It's the concern about what will happen in the future. And if we could provide some treatment that would prevent it from getting worse, I think a lot of people would be really uh, excited about that development and uh, would be really happy that we could at least stop the progression if we can't turn the clock back entirely. So that's a big focus of research today. Uh, and then lastly, what's the future of Parkinson's therapy going to look like? Uh, how is this all going to come together in the end? All right, so in terms of what causes Parkinson's disease, um, let me just, uh, start with this little diagram. So I think there are three big categories of factors that you can think about causing Parkinson's disease. 
One is genetics. Uh, so genetics is important in Parkinson's. Um, there are families in which Parkinson's runs quite frequently. They're rare. We don't see that many of them, but there are some families that have a very strong family history and may have a single gene or a driver of that disease. Uh, in most other people, it's not one gene and the family history is not that strong, but there is so-called polygenic risk. There are genetic factors that added up together. Each factor by itself contributes only a small piece, um, but added together, they lead to the risk of Parkinson's disease. And we've learned a lot more about that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Another big factor are some of the cellular processes that go on. One is aging. Uh, as the brain and body age, it's less tolerant of things that go wrong. Uh, some of the things involving aging, misfolding of proteins, uh, there's an organ, uh, organelle called the lysosome that's very important, breaking down abnormal proteins, and those don't work as well as you get older. Uh, oxidative stress is something that builds up in the body and in the brain over time. And then increasingly, we're recognizing inflammation as a process that starts and may be important in the progression of Parkinson's. And lastly, there are environmental exposures. I think this is an area where we're learning more and more just in the last few years. Uh, there's been a long story about neurotoxins, uh, compound MPTP, the famous frozen addicts described in the 1980s. Uh, but more recently, we've started to become aware of the role of pesticides, organic solvents, and things like closed head injury. And all of these things seem to have an important contribution towards the etiology of Parkinson's. So it's not one or the other, it's the interplay of these three big areas um, that seems to drive the, the cause of most, uh, most forms of Parkinson's disease. All right, so what about age? Well, the big risk factor is age, and the bad news is the older you get, the more likely Parkinson's becomes. Um, this graph over on the left shows a little bit of data about how frequently Parkinson's develops at different ages. Uh, if you're under age 29, it's a very rare disease. Even under age 40, it's quite uncommon. But as you turn the corner here to 50 to 59, and then 60, and then 70, this becomes more and more common. So the older you get, the more common Parkinson's is. And the blue and red lines here show you that actually it's more common in men than in women at almost every age. And there, there's some biological explanations for that. And uh, but in, it's uh, certainly a, a factor. We see this in our clinic that there are more men than women at almost every age affected by Parkinson's disease. Now, the other piece of this is that our population is aging. Uh, if you look at the population of Americans over the age of 65, in the year 1900, there was only 3 million people in this country over the age of uh, 65. Today, we're probably at about 56 or 57 million. And by 2060, we're going to be at 92 million people over the age of 65. So that alone is driving a big increase in the number of people in the U.S. affected by Parkinson's. And this is going to go on for quite a while as the baby, baby boomers age into the range where Parkinson's is a, is a significant concern. All right. What about genetic discoveries? So a lot has been done with the genetics. Um, as I said, in most families, uh, you, don't, you don't see very many families with a single gene driving Parkinson's. There are some, they've been described around the world. They're very important for research, but for the average patient, it's probably not one gene that is driving the occurrence of Parkinson's disease. What we found from studying large numbers of people is there are a lot of genes, uh, up to 90 in this graph here, which shows the chromosomes of the, the genetic code and the various genes, each of these has been linked to Parkinson's, but each one of these contributes only a small piece of risk. It might increase your risk by 10% if you had one of these. But if you have enough of these variations, they add up to a risk that becomes significant. So uh, the big message is not a strongly genetic disease in most cases, but the genes in the background have an important effect. From these, we've pulled several that seem to be particularly important in Parkinson's, and these have been the subject now of research that looking for ways to modify the disease. Uh, probably the three top here, alpha-synuclein, a protein called LRK2 or LARC2, and a third one called GBA. And we'll say just a few words about these. All right, so alpha-synuclein, this is, uh, I think for many scientists, the touchstone of Parkinson's has become the protein that in many ways defines most cases of Parkinson's disease. 
was first found in this family in southern Italy and Greece. And this is a pinwheel here showing you the pedigree of this family. Each one of these black dots is a, is a person who developed Parkinson's in this one family. That's a lot of Parkinson's in one family. And uh, by tracking the DNA through this very large family, they were able to find the gene. It turned out to be the gene for synuclein. And mutations in synuclein do cause Parkinson's, but they're very rare. Um, and there's only a handful of families around the world that have mutations. But what really put this protein on the map is when we looked at the Lewy bodies in the brain, we discovered that they're full of synuclein. So the Lewy body that we know is present in Parkinson's is actually mostly made of synuclein. So this is really a, a key protein in Parkinson's disease. Um, what about targeting synuclein? Can we do anything about synuclein? Uh, can we modify that for, for therapeutic purposes? Uh, there are different ways of do, doing this. Um, there's work going on in reducing synuclein production using uh, drugs called antisense inhibitors to reduce its production, things to shut down the transcription or expression of synuclein. Um, there are drugs that are in development to enhance synuclein removal, turning on autophagy or clearing it faster, also antibodies that might clear it. Um, and then what about just going after the, the abnormal forms? It turns out misfolding or abnormal forms of synuclein are probably the bad actors. Uh, some of these include uh, anti-aggregation strategies and antibodies that are specific for misfolded forms. So all of these things are, are really subjects of research. Current state of that, uh, there have been some trials published. Uh, this first one is from uh, Roche, which is a human uh, antibody that was infused as a treatment to remove synuclein. This uh, trial describes it as safe. Um, on, in terms of outcomes, they published one-year data, uh, didn't see a big effect at one year, but the, the uh, Roche company is pressing on with that. Uh, they've also studied in, uh, vaccines against synuclein as another way of removing abnormal synuclein. Again, a trial that shows largely that it's safe and uh, they need to move on to larger studies. And there are other approaches still in phase one, at least three other companies are pursuing different ways of trying to remove synuclein from the brain. Um, an important thing to know about synuclein, and this has been very much in the, in the news recently, are uh, tests for abnormal synuclein. These are called se seeding assays or uh, SSAs. Uh, this is a technique where you can take a sample, say from spinal fluid, or even maybe from the skin, and you have a circular process here where you've taken the sample, you add some synuclein to it, it forms more, it sort of forms a seed and a, a vicious cycle goes on here and generates more and more synuclein. And what that looks like in the laboratory is this red curve here. Over time, when there's a seed at the start, it builds up a lot more at the end. And we can detect that. And we can actually show that in patients with Parkinson's, they have this abnormal synuclein can serve as a source for seeds and they get this abnormal seeding assay. Uh, really become a big thing because uh, recently there was a publication from the uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation Consortium, which looked across a large number of patients and asked, eh, can we see this seeding assay in people with Parkinson's? And the answer is you can see it in a lot of people with Parkinson's. Um, the SSA test turns out to be positive and I'll put it up over here, more than 87% of Parkinson's cases. So they look at 545 cases of Parkinson's, 87% were positive with this. They looked at controls, 163 of them, 96% were negative. So this is really separating Parkinson's from not Parkinson's very effectively. Uh, there are some subgroups like the LARC2 where things are a little bit different. But in the big picture, most people with Parkinson's probably have a positive SAA test. Uh, I recently wrote a blog about this you might want to take a look at. Uh, it's in this uh, World Parkinson Congress uh, blog. I called it Good News About Bad Seeds. So these synuclein seeds are obviously a bad seed. They seem to be part of what drives the disease. But the good news here is being able to find them and test them is potentially very powerful. Uh, this is a test we can use now, perhaps to detect it very early before there are really obvious symptoms. It's a test we can use to identify people who have a synuclein problem for a research study. 
Now, should everyone run out and get a seating test? I would say no. I think most people who have Parkinson's don't need to have a seating test. It's probably going to be positive. And we wouldn't really do anything with that information right now. But this is a very powerful research tool and is really going to help us to move treatments forward. I think that's a very important development, which is why I called it good news about bad seeds. Uh, what about other targets? So uh, I mentioned this protein LRRK2. Um, as far as genetic causes go, this is a reasonably common one. Up to 4% of uh, people in North America have this as the cause of Parkinson's, and maybe a quarter in certain populations like Ashkenazi Jewish populations. An interesting thing about LARC2 is it's a kinase, it's an enzyme, it drives reactions, and the mutation that causes Parkinson's seems to turn this protein on. And that got people excited because, well, maybe we can find a drug to turn it off. Uh, we're pretty good at drugs that turn things off. And actually, there are at least three different drugs that can turn this enzyme off in clinical trials. These are three trials being run by different companies, uh, two of them by Denali Therapeutics, another by Biogen, that are testing drugs that inhibit LRK2 as a way to slow Parkinson's disease. No results published yet, but you know, to me, this is the kind of work we were testing in mice five years ago, and now we're doing it in humans. That's a really important step forward. And we're going to find out soon whether these, these work or not, and that will lead us on to the, the next steps and the next generation of, of finding a treatment to slow the disease. Um, I also wanted to say a little bit about genetics and diversity. This is a really, it, it's something... Um, we should have been paid more attention to some years ago, but I think the community is just coming around to this. So, you know, all this genetic work that I've showed you, most of these studies are DNA from people of Western European descent. Um, and so most of what we know about the genetics of Parkinson's comes from people from Western Europe. Um, but there's a lot of other people in the world and there's a lot of other genetics and understanding that and, and learning from the diverse genetics of different populations around the world is potentially very powerful. And this is an example of this. Uh, there's a consortium called the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program, or GP2, uh, which we're part of here at UAB. And we set out to recruit uh, patients who are African-American with Parkinson's. They have really not been studied. Nobody has done much at all with the genetics in people with African descent. Uh, UAB is one of the... Uh, sites that is enrolling subjects. So this is Black PD enrollment. And taking this together with data from some other sources, the group at NIH, which is coordinating this, has done a GWAS. They've scanned the genome in people of African descent. This has never been done before. And what they found, these are all the genes they tested. You can see this one in red. There's a big spike here. Uh, this is a gene that is strongly linked to Parkinson's in people of African descent. It is not found in people from other races and other backgrounds. Uh, it seems to be unique to the African population, and it's very common in that group. So here's a factor that drives Parkinson's in African American African Americans, which we completely missed uh, by studying people who are from Europe. Um, this is only the first. I mean, this is based on about fourteen about fourteen hundred. Uh, patients, when this study gets to be larger and gets into the tens of thousands, I think we're going to find a lot more. We're going to unearth a new genetics of Parkinson's that is going to be really informative. It turns out this gene is actually in a gene we knew was related to Parkinson's, but this particular mutation has never been described before. And so I think that's an example of how stepping outside of our boundaries and saying, well, what about the rest of the world? And, and what about studying the genetics of the world rather than of just people from Western Europe uh, will lead us to a lot of new information that'll be very important. All right, I wanted to say a little bit about immune system involvement in Parkinson's disease, uh, because this is something the Alabama Udall Center has worked on a lot. It's an old story, really, the data I'm gonna show you on the screen here, this many of much of this is 20 years old now. But these are different markers showing it that there's inflammation in the brain. Top left here, these are, are microglia. These are cells that light up when there's inflammation in the brain. Um, they're so-called immunoglobins, the, uh, the protein that binds to abnormal pro uh, proteins and inflammation in the brain. And you can see immune cells over here in the brown on the right making their way into the brain. These are not in, present in a normal brain, but in Parkinson's, you find these little round 
cells that are staying brown here pouring into the brain. And these are evidence of an inflammation, an immune response in the human brain in Parkinson's. But this has been known for a long time. And, and I think the thinking was, well, it's a condition where dopamine cells are dying. So of course there's a reaction. What's happened in the last few years is we've turned that on its head and started to think about the immune system as perhaps driving some of this disease. Um, and that leads you to some important questions. Uh, can you change the course of Parkinson's with an immune treatment? What, what treatment would you use? What are the targets for immune therapy? And when would you give such a therapy? Um, this is really the work of the Alabama Udall Center of Excellence. And this is the team that I work with. Um, our central hypothesis or idea is that immune cells are active early in Parkinson's and that if we're able to inhibit pro-inflammatory activities, we can protect from neurodegeneration. And so we're studying inflammation in early PD patients. We're using uh, special PET imaging, blood, and, and CSF studies. And I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, this was just pu published recently in a study. It's in a journal uh, called Movement Disorders. It's free online if you'd like to look at the details of this. But what we did in Alabama is we recruited 58 people with early untreated Parkinson's and 62 controls. Um, so these are people who've just developed the first signs of the disease and are not on any medication yet. Um, and we see them every year and have done a number of studies to ask what's going on with their immune system. One of the studies we use is this. This is a PET imaging study. It uses a radioactive dye called DPA714. And what happens is that dye gets taken up in the brain and it labels the areas of the brain that are inflamed. It labels the, the immune cells that are active. And what you can see with this, if you do a detailed analysis across different regions, is that there's increased brain inflammation present in human Parkinson's at this very early stage. So this is really, most of these patients are within three or four months of their first diagnosis. So we see it in uh, the butamen and the caudate, which are areas involved in dopamine, but we also see it in uh, the thalamus, which is involved in a relay station and different areas of the cortex, which are involved in more cognitive functions. So we see evidence for brain inflammation. And in fact, the amount of inflammation is related to some of the features of the disease, particularly some of the memory functions. So that's really interesting. And just to, to tell you where we're going to go with that, uh, the next steps, of course, are to follow these people forward. So actually, we've been following some of these subjects now for up to five years. And we're going to find out whether the inflammation that's present when they join the study has any power to predict what is going to happen to them down the road. Uh, and if, in fact, as we suspect, those with more inflammation have a more aggressive course, then that sets the stage to say, well, we should try to treat this inflammation, reduce the inflammation, and see if that improves the outcome of Parkinson's disease. So that's where we're going with that. I did want to say a few words about the environment. Um, so environmental factors in Parkinson's have become uh, of great interest recently. Uh, we have one investigator on our center here, Dr. Dean Miranda, who studies a particular toxin that's received a lot of attention in the press recently. It's called TCE or trichloroethylene. And the yellow dots over here on the map, these are uh, sites with very high TCE exposure. And a TCE is used in dry cleaning. It's used in industrial solvents. It's used in uh, degreasing. So if you're building an airplane, before you assemble the airplane, you want to get the grease off all the parts so things don't stick or slip. Uh, you might use TCE and you might wash the airplane parts with that before you assemble it. And in years past, it was common to do that and then just take the TCE out back and dump it in the dirt because no one needed it anymore. Now, we're not doing that hopefully too much anymore, but uh, the TCE stays around a long time and all these sites across the U.S. are contaminated with this substance. So that's certainly of concern. Uh, this paper just came out uh, the last few weeks and looked at um, veterans who had served at uh, Camp Lejeune in the Marine Corps. So Camp Lejeune Marine Corps base where the drinking water became contaminated with TCE. Um, this probably happened in the 1950s. Uh, turns out they had le leaking storage tanks on the, on the base. Uh, also were disposing TCE waste without taking too much care of where it went and there were spills of it. The upshot is the drinking water at Camp Lejeune had about 70 times the upper limit of acceptable 
TCE, so very high contamination. And it stayed there for almost 30 years before it was detected. Um, so obviously a lot of servicemen members went through Camp Lejeune in those days and were drinking water contaminated with TCE. So this study looked at the veterans who had served at Camp Lejeune and compared them to Camp Pendleton, which is another Marine camp which did not have the TCE. And what you find is that the Parkinson's risk at uh, Camp Lejeune is increased by about 70% for veterans who were there in this period where the drinking water was contaminated. Um, you know, this is, a, is, I think, a strong argument here that this chemical contamination is one of the things that increased the risk. Now, it doesn't, it's not 100% responsible for Parkinson's, but a 70% increase is a big risk. And this, as I said, just came out within the last week or two, uh, and more discoveries of this kind are going to go on, and we're going to have to look closely at things that are in the environment that are driving Parkinson's risk. Uh, you might think that being Camp Lejeune is, uh, uh, you know, well, I wasn't there, so why worry about it? I show this picture because this uh, is a landfill fire that was about three miles from my house. Uh, this landfill, uh, which had had, had a, a fair amount of illegal dumping in it, uh, caught on fire, and this smoke turned out to be contaminated with TCE. So it was 20 times the safe limit. Uh, actually, the EPA finally came in and put this fire out about two months ago. So uh, these things can occur even in residential neighborhoods. You don't have to be in an industrial site to see TCE exposure. All right. So let me say a few words about treatments. Uh, we have a lot of current treatments with Parkinson's. And one of the things about working in this field is for most people with Parkinson's who come to our clinic, we can find something that will help them. Uh, we have drugs like carbidopa levodopa. I call it the miracle of Parkinson's. It's a remarkable drug. Levodopa gets in the brain, replaces the missing dopamine, and can make a big difference. Different ways of delivering it. We have a group of so-called levodopa enhancers. These are mostly enzyme inhibitors. Uh, we have what I refer to as the synthetic dopamines, dopamine agonists, things that act like dopamine in the brain but chemically have a different structure. Uh, they're a group of adjuncts that help to control particular symptoms of Parkinson's. And there are some new technologies, um, directional deep brain stimulation, uh, focused ultrasound. These are both, uh, I think, really important evolving technologies. DBS, we've been using for more than 20 years now, but the, the technology and the uh, sophistication of the devices is getting better and better. And focused ultrasound, a new technique for treating some of the symptoms of Parkinson's, which I think is really gaining traction. I did want to talk a little bit about treatment of motor complications. So one of the problems in Parkinson's that you will find is, you know, levodopa does work very well, but after a number of years, you can see problems with wearing off and dyskinesias. This is a graph one of my patients drew for me some years ago about himself. He liked to graph things. He was an engineer and he graphed himself and shows that he takes some medicines in the morning, he turns on, he does pretty well. And after a couple of hours, the medicines stop working. He takes some more, but there's a delay, comes back on, and he rides this roller coaster of up and down. And this is this is wearing off. He also had dyskinesia, which are excessive movements. So been a lot of work to try and find different ways to deal with this. DBS is often used uh, in this setting and is an effective therapy. One of the things we're seeing, though, are new techniques for delivering levodopa. And uh, I work quite a bit on this myself. Um, this is something called Duopa, which is a levodopa carbidopa gel that gets pumped into the intestines uh, through a tube. And, and this does work quite well. Uh, patients who have uh, off time of, of, say, seven or eight hours a day, it may drop down to one or two hours. So uh, that is an available and FDA approved therapy. Another thing we're going to see in the coming year, though, I think, is simpler versions of this. So this is two studies looking at subcutaneous. So this is uh, uh, infusion systems where there's a small needle that goes under the skin and a much smaller pump. Uh, two different companies are working on this and are kind of in a race to bring it to market. So neither one is yet FDA approved, but I think we're gonna see it soon. And uh, I think this will be an important advantage for just treating the symptoms of Parkinson's. All right, so let me sum up with some key points here. First of all, um, we're learning a lot more about early states of Parkinson's and the prodromal or pre-Parkinson's state. And this is really important to understand. Um, 
cause of Parkinson's, genetics, environment, and changes in cell function with age are really all contributors. So synuclein, probably definitely a culprit in many cases. And we can now detect that with these seeding assays. Um, we're developing anti-synuclein treatments. These are in clinical testing. We're also trying LARC2 inhibitors. And I do think neuroinflammation may be an important target um, because all of these causes of Parkinson's ultimately do seem to lead through inflammation on their way to damage to the, to the nervous system. Um, environmental factors are emerging as an important trigger. Uh, TCE, obviously, I think is becoming a, a very hot topic. Uh, it's a very widely distributed environmental contaminant, but there are others, and clearly some pesticides have been linked to Parkinson's as well. Um, there's a wide range of existing treatments for Parkinson's, uh, and many of these are based on replacing the missing dopamine. So uh, one thing we expect to see in the coming year is some of these new pump-based delivery systems for delivering uh, levodopa, much like you would an insulin pump. It's a subcutaneous uh, infusion. I think that's going to be a really useful advance as well. So uh, what will the Parkinson's therapy of the future look like? Uh, I put this up with caution because uh, as Yogi Berra said, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. The uh, future is always changing. We never know what to expect. But this is my guess about what the Parkinson's therapy of the future might look like. Uh, and if you think about it across this spectrum from so-called at-risk to prodromal to pre-PD, early PD and advanced PD, I think in this at-risk phase and maybe prodromal, the kinds of therapies we're going to see in the future are really targeted, targeted towards specific genes. If we know someone has a particular gene or a cause that would create a high risk for Parkinson's, there may be therapies that target just that gene and try to prevent the development of the disease entirely. Um, beyond that, from the prodromal to the early, I think synuclein therapies are going to be an important part of this. Um, we know that uh, in early PD, uh, as shown by the seeding assay, many people have abnormal synuclein. Turns out even in the prodromal, up to 50% of people with those early symptoms, sleep disorders, constipation, have abnormal synuclein. So I think these synuclein therapies will be used in this phase. Um, another factor I always like to mention is if you ask me today, what is proven to change the, the course of Parkinson's? What do we have that is today in 2023 established as something which can modify the condition? It's exercise. Uh, study after study has shown that there's no question that exercise has a therapeutic benefit in Parkinson's. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. I think that's always going to be a value. Um, certainly in early and into par advanced Parkinson's is valuable. How far back can you go? Uh, should people who are with prodromal symptoms, a sleep disorder, uh, and think about exercise? Well, it's good for all of us. I, I think there's not a downside. Uh, but I do think it may actually be a value even in these very early phases of Parkinson's. And so uh, I think that's an important thing to consider. Anti-inflammatory therapies, I think this will uh, ultimately be a big part of the, the armamentarium when we get to early and more advanced Parkinson's disease. I do think these have the potential to be disease modifying. Um, levodopa, other medications, um, probably not going to go away completely. I mean, I hope we need them less if these other strategies work. But they, levodopa is very effective, particularly in early disease. And I think we'll continue to see that for a long time. And then lastly, uh, DBS and other surgical strategies are, are uh, getting better. And uh, they work quite well now. And, and with improved technology, I think they will, they will only become uh, more helpful to people over time. So in the end, I think this will look like a spectrum that depending on where you are along this this journey of Parkinson's, this, the therapies will be different. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's really amazing to watch this develop uh, over the last few years. The, the uh, field is changing so quickly. All right, let me conclude by uh, thanking my uh, Alabama Udall Center team, which works with me. Uh, a lot of people contribute to, to the work and ideas I've shown from the Udall Center here. And let me thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you, uh, Got, gathered some of the excitement that we all have for this field. I think uh, I've been working in Parkinson's for some years now, but the, the sense of excitement and the sense of 
of change and rapid advance is, is really thrilling these days. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of these things really work and let us change change the future of Parkinson's. So thank you.